Uh, we, we do have church on Wednesday night, and uh, we will be Facebook living uh, that as well. And so we want to encourage you to be a part of that. Um, we are praying for you. We are looking forward with great anticipation to being able to gather together with saints. Is there anybody that's looking forward to the rapture where we don't have to deal with the social distancing Amen. anymore? Uh, and uh, I, I am thankful this coming week I'm going to get to do something that uh, is absolutely thrilling. And I'll, I'll share that with you after the fact. But uh, um, praise God, I can tell you that people are still growing in their faith. They're still moving forward in their faith. And... Uh, we are very thankful for that reality. Amen. So stay tuned to Facebook. Stay tuned to our website, and we will keep you up to date. Listen, as soon as we can uh, ease the restrictions on uh, not having any more than 10 in the house, we will do that and, you know, put a great big sign. And I, as soon as I can, I will greet you with the biggest hug that I've ever given you. Amen. It might be a side hug. But it'll be a big one. So yep. today I want to I want to uh, share a message with you, um, and this this ties in with the resurrection. And uh, so um, let me let me just get started here. It says on the day of Jesus' resurrection, for the first week there were several issues that the disciples dealt with that it inhibited their ability to grasp that Jesus was alive. How many of you have ever had issues? I'm so thankful that Jesus is able to deal with our issues. The disciples had issues. They were afraid. They were, they were shut in not because they had to. They were afraid to go out because they thought that they might suffer the same humiliating um, type of death that Jesus had experienced. But on the first day of the week, there were people that started testifying, hey, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And there were disciples that did not believe what other people were telling them. I want to tell you something today. Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. Jesus is alive. Amen. And, and, it's, and, and a, a person's unbelief is not going to change that fact one bit or, or, or another. So Jesus came and he dealt with their fear. And he dealt with the, their unbelief. And in spite of the fact that they had walked with Jesus for over three years, they still did not understand what Jesus had been preparing them for. There was a lack of understanding, and all of that had to be dealt with. I got to thinking about that, that Jesus walked with them for three and a half years as a man, and they never understood what he was trying to prepare them for. And yet, in 40 days after the resurrection, if you want to stretch that out to 50 days, to the day of Pentecost, as they walked with Jesus and encountered everything that Jesus had for them, all of a sudden the scriptures came alive to them, and they became the agents uh, of message that Jesus wanted to use. He had to deal with their fear, their unbelief, their lack of understanding, in order for the church to arise as the messenger of good news that Jesus created them and us to be. In Luke chapter 24, as well as John chapter 20, we read of the disciples' journey to embrace the good news that Jesus is alive. Luke 24, which we're getting ready to read, deals with a group of disciples as a whole, and John chapter 20 deals with Thomas eight days later, as they struggle with reconciling the resurrection with the brutal wounds that they had seen Jesus experience and the death they had witnessed. In both accounts, Jesus deals with their unbelief with the exact same method. Luke chapter 24, verse number 36, says, Now as they, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hand and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. 
And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. In John chapter 20, in verse number 24, we read there of eight days later, Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my side, my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Amen. I want you to know today that Jesus can reach you where you are. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter how secure the enemy thinks he has you isolated. Jesus can invade your presence. Amen right now. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you that you love us enough. You love us too much to leave us bound by fear. You love us too much to leave us in a condition of unbelief. You want us to believe. You want us to understand and know that you are the one who was dead, but is alive. That you are the resurrection and the truth. And Father, today, I pray that the good news of your scars will help all of us in our journey of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today I want to share with you a message titled, The Gospel of Scars. The gospel of scars. And uh, so let's start with a newborn baby first. Okay? When, when you look at a newborn baby, we celebrate for joy. We then begin to examine to make sure that everything is absolutely perfect. And once we are convinced that everything is okay, parents set out with this one goal. To make sure that life of that child is going to be as pain-free as possible. If parents could, they would wrap that child in bubble wrap and make sure that nothing could ever harm that child. Right now, uh, the world is trying to, to mitigate this virus, but um, I don't know that we're going to be able to protect ourselves from every harmful thing that this fallen world has to offer Life in this fallen world is not about living pain-free or heartbreak-free. How many have ever been heartbroken? How many have ever experienced pain? How many of you just don't raise your hand for anything? <laughs> uh, this is a cruel world. It's a harsh world. The devil makes sure that this is as hostile an environment of faith as it can possibly be, but Jesus invaded this world because he has given to every one of us the measure of faith, and he wants us to know that he is going to restore this world to its intended created purpose that he had all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Amen. It's not about, this life is not about how little discomfort we have experienced, but how much hardship God has helped us to overcome. Along the way, we experience trauma, and in that trauma, we discover that God is right there with us to make us more than overcomers. Amen. Amen? 
I, I had dealt with things that I thought were more than I could handle because they were more than I could handle, but they were not more than Jesus could handle. Amen. And I didn't know how he got us through those waters, but I was sure glad when they were in the rearview mirror. Yes. With each victory, we developed some scars along the way. And the scars tell a story, our story. And our story is meant to testify to the goodness of God that he still heals. Amen. 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 And how many of you realize a scar is the proof that the wound didn't kill you? Yes. True. Okay. Amen. So I've got, a, I've got a challenge for you. If I died and the coroner came to you and said, no. there was no wallet on this body, and we're going to need to need you to identify the the corpse of Bob Arthur. The only problem is you can't look at him. You've got to close your eyes. Okay? I am confident that you could do it. I'm confident that you would be able to identify him. Uh. <laughs> but it may not be how you consider it. You could say, look at the size of his nose. Okay, let me tell you why I picked that. A friend of mine and I, we worked together, and we were having a conversation one day, and I said, man, you got a big nose. This is when we were teenagers. Teenagers just say all sorts of stuff. And he said, well, I hate to tell you this, but yours isn't small. And so... We actually took a ruler and we measured from the, the, the beginning of the nose all the way down to the end. You did not. And I did too. Oh my we word. did. And I want you to know mine was bigger than his was. It was, it was quite disappointing. But lots of people have big noses. So you're not going to be able to identify me by my nose. And, and, and you might recognize my hairstyle, but my hairstyle is not going to give it away because hair feels like hair. There are multitudes of men that are my height and my weight. But if you grabbed me by my right hand and started counting the digits, you could say, I'm confident that that is Bob Arthur's because I know the story of his scar. I know. I know that that's him. It, it is a mark of distinction. Before we get back to Jesus and his scars, I want to tell you about some of uh, how, how some of our scars come about. Okay? In case you don't know this, this was a fence climbing accident. That's how it happened. I caught a ring on a nail chasing a baseball, and the nail won. My finger lost. Some scars that we experience, now these are all going to come from the scriptures here. Some scars are scars of ambush, where we didn't see it coming, and all of a sudden, blam, something happened, and we were left scarred because we were ambushed like the businessman who was ambushed and left to die on his journey in Luke chapter 10. They came and they stole everything that he had of value. They beat him. They left him bleeding and wounded and dying and cast on the side of the road. And there were people who traveled by who saw him who didn't want to get involved because he was damaged goods. But there was a Samaritan who came by who came and poured in some oil and some wine and gathered him up and put him on his donkey and took him to an inn and paid the price for his recovery. And he said, when I come back, if the price exceeds what I've already paid, I will pay that as well. I want you to know that if you've ever been ambushed, that God is bigger than the ambush. Right. And he has paid the price. Some are scars of failure, such as the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Remember, she was, she was there at the well. Jesus had to go through Samaria to get to, to where he was going, but it was more than just to, uh, uh, from point A to point B. He needed to be there for that woman. 
right. just as Jesus will be there for you. And she was coming at a time of day where nobody else would be at the well she expected. She didn't want to be there because of the failures of her past. Right. But this was a stranger. It was someone that she didn't recognize. It was somebody who was outside her ethnicity. They didn't want to have anything to do with one another. And so she thought that perhaps her past might not be known. And so she and Jesus are having a conversation, which is a miracle in itself. And then Jesus reveals that he knows all about her failures. Mm -hmm. Jesus knows all about my failures. He knows all about your failures. Right. And the devil would like to define you by your failures the same way he would like to define me by my failures. But Jesus must needs come to your life the same way that he came to her life, the same way that he comes to my life. And there was an encounter that took place there. And the reason that we talk about the woman in John chapter 4 is not because of her failures, but because of the transformation that Jesus took and the scars that he took and used them as a testimony to evangelize an entire city. Right. An entire city came to meet Jesus because a woman with scars had an encounter with Jesus that said, he told me everything I ever did. Right. This is the Messiah. You need to come. And they said, we first believed because of what she said, but now we believe because We've seen it for ourselves. Amen? Don't let scars imprison us in our past. Let's allow God to transform us and use us to influence an entire city and bring about a revival like we've never seen before. Right. Some scars are unintentional scars. This was not intentional. It was not fun. I still remember them taking the bandage off that first time and the pain that, that was involved in, in just that process. The pain of removing the bandage was worse than the pain of the wound. I didn't feel this. I reached down to pick up the baseball and noticed there's a problem here. You're not supposed to be able to see your own bone. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but you're not supposed to be able to lay eyes on it. It was, it was a problem. Well, in the Bible, in 2 Samuel chapter 4, there was a, a person of royalty. He was a five-year-old boy. His name was Mephibosheth. Easy for me to say, Mephibosheth. And at five years old, his dad and his grandfather, King Saul was his grandfather, went out to battle, and word made it back to the city that Saul had been killed and that Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan, had been killed. And the nurse that was taking care of this little five-year-old boy scooped him up in her arms and started to run with him because his life was now in jeopardy. And as she was running, she tripped and she fell. It doesn't say what happened to her, but it does describe that Mephibosheth was left lame from that point forward. In just a few moments, he had gone to possibly a future heir of the throne to a damaged shell of a human being that would be left begging for scraps from that day forward. His life and his purpose were suddenly transformed, and it was going to remain that way until one day David came to the throne, and David remembered that he had a covenant with Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan, and he began to search, and he said, is there anybody that I can, that I can show kindness to? That, that prince that sat on the throne entered into covenant with me, and I, I want to show kindness to his family. And they made him aware of this unintentionally scarred young man. And David summoned him to his presence in Mephibosheth knew what that meant. Whenever there was a change in, in uh, royalty, any threats, any claims to the throne tended to be eliminated in those days. And David greeted Mephibosheth, said, Mephibosheth! And he said, what does the king want 
with a dead dog like me. You know, the devil will take our, even our unintentional scars and he will cause us to think that we are less than God thinks we are. Right. Mephibosheth might even not, might have been unaware of the covenant with Jonathan. But David knew about it. And David welcomed him into the royal household and he said, from this day forward, you are not going to be limited by your unintentional scars. You are going to feast at my table from this day forward. And that was where Mephibosheth spent his life. Scars are painful. How many of you have some scars? How many of you, if I gave you an opportunity, could tell me the pain that you went through to get those scars. Like I, I have a, a scar right here on this thumb and I can tell you when I got it. It was working in a department store as a, as a teenager and I was cutting a box with a box knife and all of a sudden the box gave way and it found my thumb. It hurt. Uh -huh. I, I can tell you about a scar from a bike accident. I can tell you about another scar from a bike accident where I thought I was evil Knievel and found out that broken bone, breaking almost every bone in your body was not the plan I wanted for my life. Scars are painful, but they don't have to be final. Amen. Amen. Some have scars of sickness, such as the ten lepers in Luke chapter 17. Did anybody have fun talking about these scars yet? <laughs> Me neither. Such as the, the ten lepers were there. And they were victims of a disease that every single day was eating away at their flesh. It made them outcasts of society. But they came across Jesus and had a conversation with him. And Jesus made their sickness a thing of the past. They, he instructed them to go and show their their showed the priest that their affliction was over, and as they journeyed, they noticed that what was eating, eating them away was no longer there, and that the devastation to their life had come to a complete and total sit, uh, stop. And one Samaritan said, before I go to the priest, I've got to go back and say thank you. Okay? And I, I want to encourage you, if you see someone this week that is being a blessing, say thank you. Yeah. It doesn't cost you anything. Nope. In, in fact, um, it's something that Jesus was quite bewildered, not what, because the one guy came back, but he said, where are the other nine? Where, didn't, I, didn't I stop the leprosy in all ten of them? Right. And so I want to encourage you today that if you've got scars of sickness that was once trying to kill you um, and, and, and you have been raised up, don't forget to say thank you. Right. Man. Use the breath that God has given you for today to praise the God who gave you today. Amen. Amen. Amen? And, and so Jesus uh, addresses that Samaritan. <laughs> And not only did the leprosy stop, but I believe that that leper was made completely whole. I'm here to tell you that God is able to heal you. But from that point forward, whenever he went forth, he was not going to be identified as the man with leprosy, but the guy who used to be uh, infected with leprosy. Right. And that God had restored him. And now, now he didn't have to be distanced from his family. He was able to go and have fellowship with his family. Today, there, we can talk about blind men in the scriptures that were born with that condition. And they had their, their sight restored by Jesus. And their miracle speaks for itself. Amen? Right. Scars have a powerful message. Some of us have scars that we bear, that we receive from our enemies. Scars where we went into battle and we were wounded in the process. Many of our veterans come home and they might look normal on the outside, but they bear scars on the inside. I want to tell you that Jesus is able to heal those scars. Amen. Some have scars that came from our friends. 
And I can tell you that out of all of the scars that are, are painful, some of them that are the most difficult to deal with are scars that come from our friends. There are two types of scars that come from our friends. Let me talk about the first one. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I bear on my body some scars that were faithfully inflicted upon me by a friend, a doctor, who removes things from my body that left unattended to, or untended to, would have damaged me or killed me. These wounds testify to the importance of godly friends. Yes. Uh, here, here in the sound booth today is a, a friend of mine. And I, I tell this story. <laughs> He's got his hand raised back there. It is one of my favorite stories. Okay? He, he has been a dear friend for over two decades. And, and he had come to, to uh, help us uh, work on a car. I was failing to be able to get a, a nut loose. And I mean, I, I was giving it all that I had. I had sprayed it with WD-40. And, and he brought some pneumatic tools. I'll, I'll never forget him. And, and he helped me in just a short period of time. He got me to a point of success where I had met with failure. And so, as we have been prone to do for the past 23 or 24 or 5 or 6 years, however many years it's been, we started talking. And the sun began to go down. And if you do not yet know this about Florida, when the sun goes down, the state bird of Florida <laughs> comes out. The mosquito. And so we were standing there. We were not having a heated conversation. We were just discussing life. I couldn't tell you what the conversation was about. And all of a sudden, without a change of expression, without raising a voice or anything, he just takes his right hand and smacks me. It was that cheek right there. So if he would have taken his left hand and smacked me right on the face. And I just stood there. Then all of a sudden, he, he held up his hand, didn't say a word, eyes wide open. And he, showed, he took his other, and he pointed to the mosquito carcass that was on his hand. And I said, brother, you don't have to explain to me. If you smack me in the face, I know this. There's a good reason for it. <laughs> I told that story another time, and a guy, I, it was when I was preaching indoors, and there was a guy who was sitting over here about aisle three or aisle four, and he took a, a, a blue pen, and he drew a little, uh, a little plus sign looking thing on his, on his hand, and he came up, and he smacked me on the side of the face, and I said, I ain't believing you. <laughs> he held up his hand, it's like, mosquitoes aren't blue. <laughs> You can, you can rest assured that when a friend who is faithful wounds you, it is not meant to harm you, it is meant to help you. Right. But just like Jesus experienced, there's another type of scars from a friend that are scars of betrayal. In Zechariah chapter 13, verse number 6, it says, And one will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friend. Any of you ever been wounded by someone that you thought loved you? Me and my daughter were the only ones. It's an isolated experience. We'd better move on to the next point. <laughs> I have a feeling I'm not, true. Uh, I'm not the only one. Luke chapter 22, verse number 47 and 48 says, And while he was still speaking in the garden, I added the in the garden, Behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? These types of scars can be some of the most traumatizing and take the longest to recover because they are scars of the heart. In Psalm 109, I'm going to turn there for you this morning. Psalm 109. In 
in verse number 21. It says, But you, O God, the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake, because your mercy is good. Deliver me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. I am gone like a shadow when it lengthens. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh is feeble from the lack of fatness. I have also become a reproach to them. When they look at me, they shake their heads. Listen to this. Help me, O Lord my God. O save me according to your mercy, that they may know that this is your hand, that you, Lord, have done. Today, if you have ever experienced a, a wound that has scarred your heart, I want to encourage you, don't let bitterness set in. Let Jesus set in. Right. Cry out to God, and you will find that he will save you according to his, her, his mercy. He will touch your heart. In all actuality, there's not a tremendous amount of difference between what Judas had done in betraying him with a kiss and what Peter had done in denying him uh, when, when given the temptation. There was the grace of God that was available. One went out and, and ended his life in hopelessness. The other one experienced the grace and the mercy of God and allowed his devastated heart. In fact, when it came to Peter, when he denied him, I want to tell you what Jesus said. He said, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. I want you to tell my disciples that I have risen, that I'm alive, and I'm going to go before them, and I'm going to meet them again. And don't forget to tell Peter. Right. You see, when Peter denied him, Jesus made eye contact with him, and Peter was cut to the heart. I'm so thankful that Jesus is able to heal our wounded heart. One, one more passage before we move on is in Psalm 147 and verse number 1. Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Today, if you've, ever, if you've had your heart just ripped in two, I can tell you from the scriptures, and I can tell you from personal experience, that Jesus heals the broken heart. Right. He is all too familiar with the, the, the scars of betrayal, and he can heal you. Some would try to live their life in such a way as to give the impression that their life is perfect and without scars. Don't ever let them see your flaws. That is their philosophy. To those people, I have a difficult time relating. Right. Because I don't know about living without scars. Not even Jesus escaped without wounds and scars. Everyone encounters pain. Everyone needs to encounter healing. And the scarring is a reminder, not of the wound, but of the healing. What can we do when we have been wounded? Okay. Anybody remember something you did and auto automatically pain lets you know that something had gone on? I was cleaning my garage one day. I was home by myself. And uh, the scar is right there. My right hand is a, is a hand filled with scars. I, I mean, I don't understand. But I mean, that hand is scarred. Uh, I, as, I was, as I was cleaning my garage, something reached out and slipped my hand. It was absolutely a hilarious story. Not because of the scar, but because of what happened after I mean, it was, it was deep. And I, I called my wife and I told her what had happened. And uh, she, she came, she looked at it, and she said, we need to take you and get stitches. And so I, we went to the walk-in clinic. And uh, they, they, they got us situated in the room. 
and they put my hand in this red solution and had me soaking my right hand in, in this red, red solution. And so the medical assistant or the nurse comes in and says, well, what are we seeing you for today? And I just held up my hand like this. <laughs> <laughs> and all she saw was the missing finger and red stuff falling. And she's like, ah! <laughs> and I said, no, not the missing finger. I cut my hand. I need stitches. <laughs> and she said, you got to tell the doctor. you got to do exactly that. Well, he, he read the chart before he came in. He wasn't nearly as freaked out <laughs> as, as, as she was. I, I, when, when, when we're gripped by pain... We don't want to stay there. I don't know about you, but has anybody ever experienced pain and the first thing that you wanted to do was stop being in pain? Yes. yes. <laughs> as quickly as possible. There is a process from getting from the wounding to the healing. When wounded in the Bible, people would have a response to this sudden onset of pain. And it would be, they would groan. I don't know if you've ever... Ah, ah, What's better? Ah, ah. You, you, you just can't even articulate what is going on. I want you to understand something today. That if you have been so wounded, if you've been so hurt by someone else or, or ambushed or any of these other types of, of wounds we've talked about today, I want to tell you something today. God speaks groaning. He understands when we can't articulate because he knows what we have need of before we even ask. I, t I tell, told my wife uh, after watching her raising our three children and they too would have wounds and they too would be bleeding and they would come to her and they would be holding it and I, and, and I told her, I said, you lie. She says, I do not. I said, you do too. Because the kids would come and they would be holding it and she'd say, well, let me see. And, and, and they would say, no. And, and, and she would say, let me see, I promise not to touch it. <laughs> and, and, and the Never. kids would work up enough courage and they would finally let her see the little bitty splinter that they had in their hand. And the first thing that she would do is she would take her hand and reach out and touch it. <laughs> but it wasn't to prolong the agony, it was to shorten the agony. And I've got good news for you today. If you are currently experiencing trauma and the pain leaves you the inability to communicate let me tell you this I understand yeah the passing away of my mother has impacted me in ways that I had never experienced before and people would ask this what can I do how can I help and I, I'll be honest with you, my answer is this. I don't know. Because I've never walked through this before. But I can tell you this. I will walk through it. I will not camp in it. I right. will not stay here forever. My God will help me through this process. The other thing that, that happens if you... Um, uh, Understand that God knows your pain, He feels your pain, and, and He understands it. Um, as I, I want to encourage you, don't use your scar, don't use your wound as the mindset, well, if I'm hurting, everybody else is going to hurt too. Right. I don't know if you've ever met somebody who was absolutely miserable in their life. Evidently not. Oh. Yes. But many people say, if I'm going to be miserable, everybody's going to be miserable. Hurting people hurt people. That's not the message of the gospel of scars. Right. The gospel of scars says, I'm not going to use my wounds and my healing to damage other people. I'm going to use it to minister healing to them. The, the second thing that is, that is described in the Bible about people who are wounded is that many times the kings, as they went into battle, if they were wounded, they would, they would speak to their chariot driver, and they would say this, get me out of the battle. Get me out of the battle. 
And I want you to know that doesn't mean that you are going to be out of commission forever. But sometimes we need a refuge yeah. that we have in Jesus where we can run to him and we, we can say, God, I got a fiery dart that made it through my shield of faith. And I know this, you're going to be able to heal me of that. I know your word says that the shield of faith quenches all the fiery darts. I don't know what happened, but I'm wounded. And I want to encourage you that God is going to heal you. You're going to live to fight another day. You are going to live to contend for the faith. You are going to live to pray another prayer. You are going to live to testify to another person. Amen? Amen. The church is a spiritual hospital. Now, I can tell you this. I don't enjoy staying in hospitals. It's been a long time since I stayed in a hospital overnight. Thank the Lord. But the church is a spiritual hospital. It's meant to be a place of healing for wounded people, not a collection of perfect people. Thank if you God. come to Merit Assembly of God looking for perfect people, it yeah. won't take you long until you find that it's a hospital. People here are in the process of healing so that they can go out and help hurting people as well. You know, right now, society, one of the reasons that we're told for all of this mitigation is because they didn't think there was going to be enough hospital capacity for all of the people that could be impacted by this virus. I've got, a, I've got a message for you today for those of you who are experiencing trauma to the heart or any other wound right now. Jesus is never going to run out of capacity. Amen. You always have access to the healing Amen. power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yuck for all of the negative scars. That's a good Oklahoma expression. Yep. Yuck. What I say if somebody makes me eat licorice. Yuck. Or curry. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or curry. Yeah, no. But there are some scars that are positive. There are some scars that are positive. For instance, Jacob in Genesis chapter 32 was left scarred by an encounter with God. He, he was transformed from a, a deceiver and a slanderer and, and, and a manipulator. And that night he wrestled with the angel of God. That night he left with his name changed to Israel, which means prince of God. That night he left blessed because he prevailed even in his wrestling match. That night the angel touched him. And because of the angel's touch, he walked differently from that point forward. Right. I want you to know that I've been scarred by the blood of Jesus. That my sins no longer have, have the dominion over me that they once did. I've been scarred because of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. And I want to walk with Him in, 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 in the, the fruit of the Spirit, in the gifts of the Spirit. I want to walk in, in march step with Him. We need encounters with God that will scar our carnal nature in such a way that we will walk more godly than we ever have before. In Luke chapter 24, we discover that Jesus' scars, they were meant to be wounds that were punitive, that were meant to be humiliating. But Jesus' scars were actually redemptive scars. Amen. They were scars that he would take and he would use for the glory of God. He would use to build faith in Thomas. He would use to build faith in Peter and all of the others that were gathered there. He would go to them and he would say, look at my side, look at my hands, look at my feet. It is me. Your scars are not only part of your story, they're part of our identity. Amen? They testify that as an 11-year-old boy, Jesus healed. As a 
a 17-year-old young man that Jesus healed, as a 40-something-year-old man, whatever age I was, that Jesus healed my hand. I, I've got scars all over me, and each one of them testified that God refused to allow me to die because he had a redemptive purpose for me. If you're still here, understand this. Jesus has a redemptive purpose for you as well. Yes. Amen. And you might be afraid that you don't have the skills necessary to lead someone to Jesus. Look to his scars. You might be afraid that you, you don't know the word of God well enough. And I want you to look to his scars and understand that the Holy Spirit is going to be dispatched so that you will be able to retain the word of God better than you've ever done it before. The scars are meant to launch us into ministry, into a new level of faith. Jesus says, the wounds, the stripes that I received, those are for your healing. His scars identify him as the resurrected Savior. His wounds were fatal, but they were not final. Don't let your scars be final. Jesus wasn't afraid to reveal his scars. He embraced them. Those nail-pierced feet purchased our, forgiven, our forgiveness, and his broken body is for our healing. Amen? Amen? There are four steps that I want to talk to you about. There's the wounding. We've talked enough about that. If you've not experienced it, give it time. <laughs> But there is also the recovery. Every time I have ever gone in for a medical procedure, they would say, now it's going to take some time to recover. recover. In a hospital, if you have a surgical procedure, they put you in a special room, and they call it the recovery room. It is a place where the wound no longer has control. It is now the place where the healing begins. Today is the day where you move beyond wounding and you move to healing. It's not the ultimate destination. It's the process that Jesus is using. It's the recovery process. We like it to be quick. In fact, every time that we pray, if someone's having surgery, we pray, God, may their recovery be complete. And may it be quicker than expected. Yes. How many of you want to recover? Today I want you to know there is still a healing balm in Gilead. Yeah. There is still a Savior who brings healing. Healed is the, is the declaration that we make. It's that, it's that uh, release that we get from the physician. And he says, I don't need to see you again. I mean, how many of you like it when the doctor says, I'm not going to need to see you again for six months? I'll take a year. Yeah. How many of you like it when he says, I don't need to see you again for a year? Yes. I don't need to see you again, period. You're done with the healing process. I mean, okay. And then they will say this, and you're cleared to go back to work. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to America having the declaration, America, you are cleared to go back to work again. Amen. 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 You have purpose. You are not meant to be a couch potato. Dang it. <laughs> you are not meant to, or you are not meant to, to just sit around and twiddle your thumbs until your last breath comes. You have divine purpose. Amen. And, and that, that scar is part of it. In, in the New Testament, it says, whereby you may comfort others with the comfort that you have received. Amen? Amen. I, I want to tell you what to do with your scars and God's redemptive purpose. Testify. 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 And testify some more. People know about your wounds. Okay? 
Someone once said that if you have a good experience with retail, I was in retail, that they will tell one or two or three people. If they have a bad experience with retail, they'll tell nine. It's true. Or ten. Or a hundred. Now with Facebook and, and, and Yelp and all of those places in review, you have a bad experience, they're going to go out there, they're going to tell billions of people. Horrible experience. People know about your pain. They know what others have done to you. But don't, I want to encourage you this. Don't keep picking the scab. Let the healing be final. And use that healing to testify. The devil thought he was going to take me out. But Jesus took me up. Jesus sent me on a higher ministry. You know what Paul said? Paul, Paul was there when, uh, when the first martyr of the church, he, he was holding the garments while they took, out, took, took him out and, and stoned him to death. And you know what, uh, what Paul experienced later on? He said, I've been thrown to the wild beast. If I, if I can add, add something, and I live. I've been beaten with rods, and I've lived. I've been stoned, and I live. I've been attacked, I've been imprisoned, and I live. He was shipwrecked multiple times, and he lived. He never allowed the wound to be the final determiner as to whether or not he was going to move forward. He says, I have purpose, and no wound is going to stop me from achieving my purpose. He right. was on a shipwreck, and they said, we've given up all hope of being saved. And, and Paul got up and said, oh, no, 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 no. God stood. I had an angel of the Lord that stood by me last night. And he said, Paul, you've still got purpose. And I know this. He's going to give me everybody on this ship's life. Because he loves us. Amen? Amen. Jesus told Thomas, he said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Is there anybody here that believes that Jesus was crucified on the cross? Yes. yes. That they, they did put that crown of thorns on his head. They did pierce his side, this side. <laughs> they, 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 did, they did pierce his side. They did verify that he was dead, and they threw him in a grave, and they sealed him, and they said, we have seen the last of you. And Jesus said, I don't think so. Hallelujah. Amen? We have the blessing that Jesus said that Thomas wasn't going to get to experience because we believe even though we haven't seen. It goes on and it says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why did did John write about Jesus appearing and showing his wounds? Why did Luke record the same event? Why, did it, why was it so important that the disciples ex experienced the wounds that weren't fatal? Or they were fatal, but they weren't final. Because Jesus wanted them to believe. And he wants you to believe. He wants me to believe. And he wants us to have life in his name. That wound, the devil intended to take you out. But Jesus intends for you to have life. Amen. Believe Jesus when he shares the good news of his scars. His testimony of, to Thomas concerning us is that we are blessed. And that John tells us that we get to have life. Now, I don't know if our resurrected body is going to have scars. I, I personally don't think so, but I do know that Jesus' resurrected body does. Amen? I'm not going to be known by my wounds when I get to heaven. I'm going to be known because of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in my life. Amen. Amen. Jesus' scars testify to his victory over death, his victory over hell, his victory over your sin, and his victory over my sin. Today, will you accept 
his good news today and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. When you say yes, he heals the wounds of sin and your scars will testify that what the devil intended to kill you with could not match the power of Jesus to heal you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. If you are currently in a wounded condition, look around to the healings that Jesus has brought to you and to those you know. Too often, we forget about the past healings whenever we're going through a current wounding. Right. I want to encourage you. Let your past encounters build your faith to your current recovery. Because Amen. Jesus is going to heal you <laughs> and raise you up. Let those scars build your faith that healing is on the way. If we were here right now, and every, you know, ten thousands of people were gathered, we'd be asking if you're here and you want to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I'd ask you to raise your hand. But I can't see you. So I want to ask you to do this. On, on Facebook Messenger, you can send a private message, and you can say, Pastor Bob, I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins and be the Lord of my life. If you will send us a message on there, we will respond, we will pray with you, we will rejoice with you. I, I, I will dance a jig <laughs> when I get messages like that. Because heaven's rejoicing, and I want to do what's going on in heaven. And so, if you will contact us and let us know uh, what we can stand in faith with you concerning, we will do that. Let's believe like the disciples believe. And let's take the gospel to our community in our day and time the same way that they did. I, I want to pray for you. Amen? I want to pray for you. That your scars will testify the goodness of God. And that God will use them to reach other people in Jesus' name. Father, thank you right now that you are the God of all comfort. That you are Jehovah Rapha. You are the Lord, our healer. Jesus, by your stripes, we are healed. Thank you that you understand what it's like to be wounded. And God, I pray that anybody who is going through trauma right now, and Lord, recovery seems so far away. Lord, all they can do, they can't communicate it to anybody else. God, I pray today that they would, that they would hear from heaven, that you understand all that they're going through, that you not only are aware of it, but you are going through it with them, and you feel their pain. God, I want to thank you right now that your scars testify of our redemption. Lord, may faith arise in our hearts and may we go forth boldly to take the good news that Jesus is not looking for people without flaw. He's looking for people who've been healed, whose body reveals the scars to the healing power of Jesus Christ. We take the gospel of our scars today and testify to the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to ask you to do one more thing. And that is, if you're watching on Facebook Live, would you not only let us know that you watched it, click a like or a, a heart button or an emoji or something like that, but would you also share it? It, it, it's just simply a click of a button and say, I want to share what, what uh, Pastor Bob had to say today. Someone that you know may be hurting, and they need to know that Jesus will heal them. God bless you. We'll see you back here Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, and uh, let us know if anything good happens in your life or you need us to pray with you. God bless you. We love you. We love you.